Hello, I'm Bob Plankers. I'm a senior technical marketing architect at VMware. And uh, let's talk about protecting our workloads. Um, infrastructure, vSphere infrastructure isn't there to serve itself, right? You know, the end goal is always to have a workload hanging around, uh, workload doing something to help us, uh, help our businesses move forward, that sort of thing. And so uh, let's talk about protecting them. This is a interesting day and age because, you know, we've got ransomware. Ransomware is a wonderful, wonderful thing to drive. Well, it's not wonderful, clearly, but it's a great monster under the bed, you know, the uh, uh, boogeyman to try to move us forward as far as security goes. You know, there's never really been a compelling reason to do a lot of the security, you know, because other things just seem to be more important. But now uh, that's changing, you know, and it's it's good. And so putting some thought towards it. Uh, here's my agenda, uh, the seven different things. Thinking about it, you know, vSphere, there's a lot of stuff in vSphere. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that in just a second. We'll talk a little bit about the fundamentals. If you've watched a talk of mine in the past, you know I always cover a couple of things quickly at the beginning. Uh, we'll talk about isolation. We'll talk about uh, uh, native key provider. That's new in vSphere 7, the latest updates, uh, and some encryption stuff there. We'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the encryption functionality. VTPM, a lot of questions about that lately with some of the, the news from Microsoft about uh, TPM requirements. Uh, Virtualization-based security, again, turning on device guard, credential guard, that sort of thing. DRS and HA, you might say, Bob, that's that's kind of remedial that's kind of basic right yeah well yeah you know but it might might be a good opportunity to go check your settings we'll talk just a little bit about a couple of things you can do backups it's not about backups right it's about restores you know and maybe not letting the attackers in and then securing infrastructure some ideas there we've got a lot to cover in 30 minutes so let's get moving uh so start first zero you know interestingly enough powerpoint doesn't allow us to uh to actually start a list at zero it has to start at one so i learned that in this presentation here but zero security concepts things we need to talk a little bit about in order to understand the rest of it uh when we talk about information security we always talk about uh we uh, there's the sort of three lenses the three ways we think about information security and the, this is known as the cia triad confidentiality integrity and availability and confidentiality is just keeping data to ourselves you know keeping the attackers from accessing it uh keeping it private where it, it needs to be private integrity is the idea that when i leave a system somewhere leave data somewhere i want to return to it and have it be in the state i expect you know i don't want bit rot to happen it's not even a, a an attacker thing you know sometimes there's hardware failures all of that stuff but uh integrity is a you know ransomware is kind of an integrity problem it's also an availability problem uh because my data is not available to me we build these systems to use them we need them when we want to use them when we want to use them and if they're not available to us when we need them or when we want to use them, that's a problem. Why did we build them? You know, why spend the time and effort and the money on it? And so uh, that's, yeah, it's important to think about th these things. And, and when we think about vSphere, one of the things we don't talk about a lot is that nearly every feature in vSphere is aimed at, at risk reduction, risk mitigation, uh, and we can take nearly every feature, and this is not a list of every feature in vSphere. Uh, I just took some of them, and you can file them into these three categories, and sometimes in more than more than one category. You know, all of these features are plated to, to something here, and so everything in vSphere, seen a particular way, everything in vSphere is uh, a security feature, right? You know, at least I like that. It offers me the chance to talk about a lot of different things. So. Uh, let's talk about a couple other things the idea of defense in depth we talk about this from time to time what does it really mean well it means that you should have overlapping security controls you know the uh you should have firewalls uh, you know like a good example would be a perimeter firewall and then a host based firewall as well you know and you can do this with the vcenter server appliance the vcsa you can add a firewall there and you can have a perimeter firewall as well so if something happens to that perimeter firewall you've still get some other protections as well 
Um, the uh, uh, patching is like that. You know, if you can't patch immediately, something comes out, you've got all these other protections. You've got the firewalling, you've got good authentication, you've got all this other stuff that, that can help keep attackers off of your systems for long enough so that you can, you can figure out what you're doing there, you know. Uh, another concept is least privilege. The idea that a user, another system, a script, all that stuff should only have the permissions that it needs to do its job, you know. Uh, and this this is tough, you know, because it's when you're setting something up, it's easy to, to grant it administrator rights. Oh, it works. Well, yeah, it works. I mean, it's got full run of the whole system, right? And uh, uh, but we can't do that anymore. We need to we need to be granular about permissions. We need to figure that that stuff out, because that's what attackers are using to to break in. They they find a script that has administrator rights. Because I don't want to call it laziness, but it's for maybe forgetfulness. Uh, it starts out maybe laziness. I just want to get this working. You know, I'll give it administrator rights and I'll go back to fixing it. I did this stuff for for two and a half decades, for twenty five years, and. Uh, um, out in out in IT and I get it you know like you just want to get it working and then you forget about it you know you never really go back to it and that's been sort of the joke among sysadmins it's not a joke it's just sort of reality is that um, you never you never get back to it you got to do it right the first time and make sure you don't leave it until it's right because you're not coming back to it unless it breaks so uh, so there's a version of least privilege that's called zero trust. Zero trust gets a lot of uh, a lot of attention nowadays, because it was mentioned in the U.S. It was mentioned in executive presidential orders and things like that. And uh, um, zero trust is the idea that, uh, and it's a security design concept. You can't really go and buy zero trust. I know there's some companies that sell zero trust, and that's interesting. Um, but it's it's a way of designing things. It's uh, security is a process. It's a way of thinking about things. Zero trust. We shouldn't be trusting devices or people blindly. We shouldn't be trusting them by default. You know, uh, and you see this a lot with IP addresses. Well, you know, if Bob is coming from from this location, you know, like Bob is logging in from this location, and so because he's the login is coming from this location, it's all right. You know, firewalls are like that. That's the way firewalls work. They trust based on IP address and stuff like that. But we we need to do a little bit better, especially around user credentials. We need to keep verifying things. And so you'll hear about this. Uh, you know, also just more internal perimeter perimeter controls. And to that end, I want to move on to isolation here. Let's talk about isolation. You know, internal perimeter controls. Uh, this is a medieval castle. I don't know which one. But uh, um, it's got perimeter controls. It's got a moat, and or well, it had a moat. I guess it's dry here, uh, and uh, it's got those big walls. But once you're inside those walls, you can do whatever you want, right? I mean, there are a few internal controls, but not much, you know. And this is how IT is largely set up, you know. And we need to we need to move past that. We need to move. This is the American famous American prison Alcatraz. It's out in the bay, uh, the San Francisco Bay. Uh, it is like a castle. Uh, people did not enjoy being there, I, I suspect, but uh, uh, I enjoyed touring it. But the uh, uh, I like it because this is what we need it to turn our IT systems into. It's this has got a great moat that it's filled with sharks and that water is really cold, uh, and but it's got internal controls as well because it is a prison, and so you can't move freely around inside of a prison inside of a jail. And uh, that's what I'm not saying that we should turn our IT infrastructures into jails, but uh, we need to make it so that attackers can't move very freely there without us noticing. So one of the ways there's some a few ways to do this. Um, you know, my good fences make good neighbors. Uh, there's a lot of trust that we place in IT systems. Active Directory, centralized directories. We do a lot of our, our authentication and authorization there, you know. And so somebody who breaks into Active Directory and they get domain admin, you know, think about all the vulnerabilities that have come out for that. 
And this is not me throwing Microsoft under the bus. You know, they do a terrific job of patching this stuff. But we need to consider there's a lot of, as the saying goes, a lot of eggs in one basket there. And if an attacker can break into your Active Directory and add themselves to the VMware group, you know, or the vSphere group, game over, right? They can just log in as an, as an administrator and then they can do whatever they want. You know, so that's not cool. Using SSO to split that up where you do authentication with Active Directory, but you do authorization through SSO. That's a good idea there. Uh, enhanced link mode in disaster recovery. Um, I see a lot of organizations, and I was guilty of this. I learned this one the hard way. Lest you ever think that I'm just talking just to talk, which I guess sometimes I do. But I learned this one the hard way out in the field, you know, as a customer. Uh, I had my DR environment linked, enhanced link mode to my production environment. And in early vSphere 6.7, not that we would ever have bugs, but early vSphere 6.7, we had a bug where uh, it would replicate and basically make the, uh, uh, the LDAP servers, the SSO, uh, the PSCs and stuff like that not function correctly. And I had my DR site taken out with my production site. Not cool. So consider those relationships. Keep them separate. Well, if an attacker breaks into your production environment, will they be able to destroy your DR environment as well? Uh, hopefully not. Out-of-band hardware management, SSH plugins. Uh, you know, out-of-band hardware management often has backdoors into ESXi. There's USB NICs and things like that. Go through and shut all that stuff off. Make sure that uh, attackers can't get into the consoles and that um, you know, can't, can't, there's a lot of APIs there, go, and they're all on by default, go through your hardware management, isolate them, put them on their own VLANs and all that stuff, and speaking of that, infrastructure perimeter control, keep all that stuff separated, keep it isolated, and you'll be in good shape. Encryption, native key provider, native key provider was added to vSphere 7 update 2, and it is extremely easy to enable it, you pick added native key provider. You know, I haven't done a demo because it is, I need to do a demo of this. Uh, but it, the demo is going to be a minute long. You pick added native key provider. The hardest thing is like giving it a name, you know, and uh, um, it'll create a key. The uh, And then um, you'll be able to use it. You'll be able to use it for all your encryption purposes. And how it works, basically it creates a key derivation key that gets pushed out to the hosts. And then that key is used to help encrypt the uh, uh, the VMs. There's a data encryption key on the VM level, and the data encryption key belongs to the VM. The data encryption key is stored, encrypted with the key derivation key. So the cluster has access to it, but that VM can move around vMotion and do everything normally. So, uh, and native key provider, you know, it, it enables VM and vSAN encryption. Uh, VM encryption, you can it's very flexible. You encrypt the home files, VMDKs, uh, whatever you want on the storage you're on. vSAN encryption, it encrypts the storage. It doesn't encrypt the VM itself. I mean, you can double encrypt if you want, but that's a choice you make. Uh, VM encryption uh, will make the VM look like random data on disk. And so that's hard on deduplication uh, systems, uh, systems that compress and deduplicate will uh, uh, you'll end up using the full space of of your uh, your allocation there that's not cool well it depends on your goals but you need to plan for it uh, vsan deduplication and compression it vsan does its encryption in a way that preserves its ability to deduplicate and compress and so that's definitely a feature there but there are different use cases for this and i can't there's not a there's not a single best way to do this. It'll depend on your use cases and what your your will, what you need to do. Uh, VM needs to be off in order to enable the VM encryption. Uh, you need to in, uh, wait for the re-encryption to finish. There are ways to do that. You can do if you've got a big VMDK, you could skip that. You know, just do the home files if you're interested in turning on like VTPM and that. But, uh, uh, but it does need to be off in order to turn that stuff on and to add a VTPM. We'll talk about VTPM in a second. Uh, whereas vSAN encryption, you can enable it uh, with the cluster and workloads running. It will reformat all of the disk groups, and that will take some time. Uh, depending on what your storage is, it may take quite a while. But it does that automatically in the background, so you don't have to worry about it. 
VM uh, encryption enables VTPM. I just mentioned that. And when you enable VM encryption, you also get new permissions in vCenter server uh, to control encryption. So you can actually deny people the ability to decrypt VMs and things. So that's that's pretty nice. Works well with VM encryption. vSAN encryption works well with VM encryption. A lot of people use vSAN encryption to encrypt the data at rest. And then they use VM encryption to encrypt the home file so they get VTPM support. You know, that's a common use case. But again, you know, your use case may vary. Depends on what you're trying to protect. Uh, so I mentioned that the VM needs to be powered off. It's basically a checkbox or a storage policy change. You can do it either way, um, you know. Uh, just tips and tricks. Basically, I was saying that you can be selective if you don't want to wait for the whole VM decay to, the whole VM to, to re-encrypt. A blank VM decay uh, encrypts instantly because there's nothing to do there, right? And so you can use, a lot of databases can move their own data around, and that's actually kind of nice. So people use that. Uh, be careful with double encrypting. And then again, you know, thin provisioning, uh, deduplication, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, definitely test it. Definitely test it. So we talked about VTPM. VTPM is a hot topic uh, for protecting workloads and uh, basically makes it easy to uh, um, easy to use in, in guest protections and things like that. It requires a key provider, which we just set up with native key provider. There's still the traditional key provider methods as well, uh, the KMS systems and whatnot. Uh, one of the things about vSphere 7, I'm, uh, one of the update releases here, we actually added lin a full Linux support. You could add a TPM, a virtual TPM to uh, a Linux host, but you had to, you had to make it a Windows host uh, or a Windows VM temporarily, and, and uh, we fixed that. So that was something that uh, somebody had given us feedback about, and we appreciated that, and so we did that. VTPM is available on all license levels now as well, uh, along with native key providers. So you can turn on VTPM wherever you're at. So full TPM 2.0 uh, compatible emulation. It's not an emulation. Well, it's, yeah, it's an emulation, I guess. Uh, compatible device. It's TPM 2.0. Your workload will not know the difference between a hardware a TPM and the virtual TPM. And speaking of hardware TPMs, you don't have to have a hardware TPM in order to, to have a virtual TPM. Hardware TPMs, we definitely recommend those in hosts. They give, give you a lot of security at the ESXi level. And uh, we don't, uh, um, we, uh, uh, but we don't require it for VTPMs. You know, the V is virtual, right? So, yeah, the two are separated. While we in encourage both, using both, they're independent of each other. Uh, here, hang on. There we go. VBS, number four, VBS. We're cruising right along here. Virtualization-based security. So virtualization-based security enables uh, uh, Microsoft Device Guard and Credential Guard starting to be a popular compliance thing, if not a security thing, that people are doing on new Windows deployments. And uh, what it does, it uses a little bit of Hyper-V in order to enable the, uh, uh, to create a secure enclave for passwords and security, security um, secured material, let's put it that way, keys and cryptographic keys and whatnot. So what that does, yeah, basically adds uh, Hyper-V. So it's Hyper-V, a little bit of Hyper-V running on top of ESXi in, inside that VM. Kind of interesting. There's some performance considerations there sometimes. Uh, it does require secure boot and EFI boot, uh, uh, IOMMU, the memory management unit. Uh, when you check the uh, uh, enable Windows virtualization-based security, then it will automatically add those and change the VM over to those. So if you're building new templates, if you've got something, it's it's hard to, it's hard to change between EFI and, and BIOS or vice versa. Uh, so set this up on your new templates. Even if you don't turn it on in the Windows Guest OS, um, you can set this up as part of your templates to start with. You know, does not require VT, TPM. There's a lot of compliance frameworks that say that you need, need to have it need to have the TPM, but it doesn't require it. It likes having it, but it doesn't require it. And one thing to consider is nested virtualization can't do pass-through hardware because of the because it's uh, Hyper-V on ESXi. We can't, we can't pass those IOs through like that. There's not a, a way to do that. Nobody can do that. It's not just a limitation of, of, of ours. It's a limitation in general. And so something to keep in mind if you need GPUs. 
but works exactly as it does on on physical windows boxes you know so from here you turn this on and then you go into your guest os group policy you can enable it it enables just the same way as everything else so you don't need to install hyper v if you run into instructions turn about turning this on and it says to install hyper v those instructions are really old find some new ones you do not need to windows will take care of you if you turn on the g uh, the group policies turn it on in the registry um the, well use the group policy but uh, um it'll take care of everything for you drs and ha you know again you might say bob you know this is sort of remedial topics here but uh, it's a good time you know people shut this stuff off i was guilty of disabling drs rules when and my team the team that i led uh, at a university here in the U.S., the uh, um, uh, would get very mad at me because I would disable DRS rules for patching and things like that, and then forget to turn them back on. So now is my reminder to go in and, and check all of that stuff. Uh, but you might want to consider your workloads. You know, maybe, and this is a good opportunity to talk to your workload folks as well, your workload admins. Hey, do you have any app app servers that uh, um, that shouldn't be on the same host? You know, turn that. We probably going to find a bunch of people that are willing to talk to you about availability in that, and that's a great conversation to have. Sysadmins, vSphere admins only get seen when something is wrong, so being proactive about talking to to people hey what can we do to make your your application more available can we separate things you know that sort of thing while you're in here i don't have an uh, illustration of it but uh, you might also want to pin your vCenter server to a particular host so if all of if you're hosting it inside a cluster that way you don't have to search for it if, it, if everything is off sometime so uh, where you can use should rules and not must rules um, should rules allow drs to violate those to to uh, uh to break the to break the promises for a little bit while patching and so that's that's a good thing you know so should rules enable you to patch without disabling these things ha uh you might want to go in there and check the defaults you know check to make sure that the policies that are in there uh, the default policies um, probably aren't what you want you know and so go in and check and check all those settings make sure that they're they're set up correctly so that if something goes wrong something goes wrong in the middle of the night all your workloads restart and you have less of a problem to deal with later backups i don't i don't want to talk about well i don't want to talk about backups backups are a thorny problem backups are a way that a lot of ransomware attacks are happening Backups are the last line of defense against ransomware, and the attackers know it. You know, and what I will ask is, can a rogue administrator, can somebody who's broken into your corporate Active Directory, added themselves to the corporate Active Directory VMware group, logged into vCenter as an administrator, uh, can they delete or corrupt all your backups? In a lot of cases, the answer is yes, you know, because you've got plugins installed in vCenter server that just connect the two systems together. You don't have the isolation that you need, you know, and so thinking about that, what can a rogue administrator do? You know, can they corrupt your backups? Can they delete your backups? So deleting your backups, they're not going to do that because that's an obvious thing, you know. Corrupting them, you know, uh, or, you know, deleting them when they go and do the, the encryption for the ransomware stuff. That's what I'd be worried about. And so can they do that? How can they do that? How do you prevent it? Are there, do I have a, a single good answer for that? No, I don't. It's going to require you to go to take a look at it and, and think about the problem a little bit. But I urge you to do that because, again, backups are your last line of defense. And even if you pay the ransoms, people are discovering that you pay the ransom and the decryptor doesn't work sometimes. Uh, or, you know, you don't want to pay the ransom because that gives the attackers, that gives the bad guys what they want. You know, they get got paid for, for the attack. And so being able to restore is really important. So there's also some considerations there, being able to restore app, applications and things. How would you restore a database? that uh, maybe the operating system is corrupt maybe it, it would be a good idea to have two a database disk and and an operating system disk so that you can restore one separately and then mount it on a fresh vm that sort of thing and you know thinking about this stuff you think about it as part of ransomware 
uh, resiliency, but um, it pays dividends. It pays pays off for a lot of other stuff day to day. You know, cleaning this stuff up and having good answers for it is a good plan. Last, there's no better way to protect workloads than to keep the infrastructure safe and secure as well. Uh, there's a couple of things. I'm not going to say patching. Patching is always what we say. And uh, I, we definitely encourage patching. Please patch. Honestly, patch. Um, patching is the only way to remove a vulnerability. But here, well, I guess I did talk about patching, didn't I? The uh, uh, Anyhow, one of the big things, vCenter server is only for vSphere admins. Uh, places that adopt that mentality have, you know, every time you add somebody to vCenter server, you would increase the probability that 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 somebody's going to break in using their account. You know, vSphere admins understand the the role that they play and the important uh, the importance of what they're doing, you know, and to keep that stuff secure. Other people might not, and I run into a lot of organizations that just allow everyone to log in to vCenter server, and that is a that's an interesting idea. I'll just leave it at that. Everyone's use cases are different, but the fewer people you can you can get in there, the or the fewer people you have, the, the easier it is to protect. Uh, shut ESXi management interfaces off. Nobody should be logging into ESXi directly. All management should go through a vCenter server. Use lockdown mode on ESXi. Uh, really important. Uninstall extra stuff. Uh, there's a lot of things that are probably in your environment. I know back when I was doing the stuff out in the field, heck, even in my lab, my lab's a little bit that direction. Uh, and the even in my lab, I've got some things that I don't really need, and it's attack surface. It's things that I've got to remember to patch. It just drags. And so unless you really need it, get it out of there. Plugins, vCenter server plugins, all that stuff. Get them out of there. You don't need that stuff. Um, good fences make good neighbors. Keep it keep it separate you know also it helps with patching and upgrades and things and then separate accounts uh for author is uh separate uh, um separate admin accounts that way you know if my planker's account gets fished for some reason you know somebody sends me a a spear phishing email and i click on it you know vSphere admins are not immune we like to think that we're better than that we're not okay and uh, uh sometimes it happens and us, what makes us better than uh, better than the rest of all the desktop users, is that uh, um, we we should know better, right? And but what makes it hard is when we lose our accounts, when our accounts get compromised, everything is in jeopardy. And so, uh, you know, so if I use a Planker's account for my normal logins day to day, I should have a Planker's dash ADM or a Planker's dash. Uh, vSphere or something, something different so that the attackers, when they try to break in, they have to generate alarms. Uh, and we can log log that and monitor the logs. Anyhow, uh, we've got the vSphere security configuration guide. Our time's almost up here, so I'm hustling through. Uh, this is the baseline security stuff. There's a new version coming out soon. Uh, keep your eyes open for that. Uh, and yeah, core.vmware.com. We get a lot of resources here as well. And so uh, ransomware resiliency, we've got compliance, uh, GDPR, NIST 800-53. If you do regulatory compliance, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Check under the solutions menu for compliance. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you folks. I hope you're all staying safe. And uh, um, yeah, we'll get through all of this stuff here. So take care of yourselves, okay? Thank you very much.